Okay, if I may have your attention, please. All right, so uh, uh, my, my com uh, laptop seems to have died down on me right now, so I uh, won't be able to use that, but I've written a few essential things on the board. Uh, let, let me just uh, refresh your memory about where we were. Uh, I'll typically do that, recapitulate, take the first few minutes of each lecture to recapitulate where we are. Uh, in our, both in our chronology and with respect to uh, the syllabus as well. Um, and, and in my closing moments, as you might recall uh, from last week, uh, I'd been talking to you about what had been happening in India in the 1770s. Uh, I'd mentioned to you 1773, uh, something called Lord North's India Bill or Regulating Act, uh, which was uh, uh, the first great attempt by Parliament uh, to regulate the affairs of the East India Company. Uh, recall what the real significance of this is. The real significance is that Parliament understands that the East India Company is becoming a state within a state. Who's going to regulate this undeclared state? Right? That's what the company is. Uh, it's, uh, if the company is a trading enterprise, but now it has... Uh, suddenly become a ruling power. And it's become a ruling power over an enormous landmass, which was obviously much greater than anything that England itself was, uh, and a landmass that's obviously extremely complex. Now, of course, uh, at this point in time, uh, British possessions are still confined largely to eastern India, right? And one of the, one of the histories that we are going to look at very briefly is how British rule is going to expand uh, over the course of the next several decades. Uh, but this is, what, this is what the significance of this particular act is and what the Lord North's Act uh, or India Bill of 1773 did was it established a Supreme Court right, of Bengal, Supreme Court for all of India, one may put it this way. At this point in time, the British are only in Bengal, but gradually as, as their territory expands, this Supreme Court will have jurisdiction over whatever becomes absorbed into British India. And then in turn, let us understand what the significance of the, what the, significance of, uh, the Supreme Court is. It is the first attempt by the British to suggest that we are going to impose a regime of law and order. And this is a, a very significant claim because the British thus far have assumed that India is a despotism. It's a despotism. That, it's, that it is a, a country which really has no law because what happens in a despotism? The despot, the dictator, is responsible to no one. Right? And in turn, it means that the life and limb, the life property of every individual is really suspect. In other words, that the, everyone is vulnerable under a kind of a despotism. Now, when you have a Supreme Court, the argument tacitly is that we are going to bring something that India has never had before, namely a regime of law and order. And I have to say that this is obviously always one of the justifications behind every colonial enterprise, right, that we are going to bring a regime of law and order. Right? And then we have 1784, which is another act, it's called Pitt's India Act, and that, in my concluding moments, I had talked about that. And what did, the, what did Pitt's India Act do? It further eroded the powers of the company. That is that it brought a greater measure of parliamentary control, uh, and to put it in a different language, war and peace are now the jurisdiction of the state, not just of the company. Right? This is what we effectively are saying is the significance of these two measures. So this is, this is where I had concluded my remarks before and, and in my concluding lecture, and I had also talked to you about the emergence of you know, Warren Hastings. So I'm going to pick up the narrative from there, but I want to do it in a larger vein. But before I do that, there's a question here. Not entirely, no, because it depends on which local Indian ruler we're talking about. So if you, let, let me just do, look, this is a rough map of India, right? Okay, so this is the Bengal presidency here. This is the Bengal presidency. This is where British rule has, 
has been established. Bengal yeah, the Bengal Nawab, yes, but your question was local rulers. Well, the question is which local, right? Which local rulers are we talking about, right? So if we're if we're talking about over here is the Sikh kingdom in Punjab. This is it's you know you're talking about over a thousand miles west is the state of Punjab, uh, and the state of Punjab is not going to be absorbed into British India until the 1840s. 1840s. I mean, that's, that's uh, 80 years after the conquest. Right? And by no means can we describe the ruler of the Punjab, Ranjit Singh, not, not at this time, he's not the ruler in the 1770s, but he's going to be ruling the state of Punjab uh, for about uh, 40 years uh, from roughly, if I recall correctly, from about 1801 to 1839. By no means can we describe him as a puppet. In fact, actually, the British did not want to try to even try to absorb the territories of the Sea Kingdom because they didn't want to enter into a war with him. So it really depends. Yeah, I think that that would be that if you say that within the Bengal presidency, we could say that the Nawabs have now been rendered impotent to a great measure, you know. All right. OK, now let's put it in a larger analytical frame. And that larger analytical frame is the question for us is, what were the schools of governance? What were the ideas that the British brought to them when they are faced with the task of governing these territories? And, and when I say, let me reiterate once again, that when now I'm talking not just about the Bengal presidency, I'm talking about, because this is where we are not adhering strictly to the chronological um, framework, right? We're now looking at India, which is now firmly under British rule, portions of India, and in the 1770s, and all the way until 1858, 1857-58, when there's going to be what's called the Great Indian Rebellion, and the company will no longer be uh, uh, involved at all, because the company is going to be pretty much abolished. Right? But that story we'll get to much later on. But we're saying that this 70, 80 year period is what I'm really speaking about. Uh, and to some extent, what I'm speaking about now is also true of the second half of the 19th century, moving even into the early decades of the 20th century. That is that the British, who are going to be charged with ruling India, right, they are people who represent different dispositions. One shouldn't assume that all of them thought along identical lines. They may all have agreed on certain Things. They might have agreed, for example, tacitly with the point of view that the British had a certain kind of moral obligation to their Indian subjects. They might have interpreted that moral obligation very differently. And that moral obligation in turn was itself based on the idea that they represented a superior civilization. After all, if we have now been charged with the responsibility of ruling okay, this enormous land mass which will grow over the decades uh, and ruling a population that is much, much greater than anything that you had in the British Isles, then by what right are we here, right? What, what is it that makes us capable of governing these people? For example, how many European officials knew any Indian languages? Hardly any, hardly any. Now you're gonna to have to have to develop an apparatus for teaching Indian languages, will you not? Unless one assumes, of course, that one can go into a country and not at all bother with the languages and still have some kind of way of being able to interact with the people over there. Now, of course, you could argue, but think of it this way, the argument I'm gonna to suggest to you now, this will become true increasingly over a period of time, but it's not true in the 1770s. Namely, somebody could argue that, well, yes, but what if, what if Indians learn English? Then we have a way of interacting with these Indians, but that's going to take a period of time. You're gonna need institutions, will you not, to be able to teach English to Indians. And at this point in time, in the 1760s, 1770s, there's no, edu no apparatus of that kind. This apparatus will develop over a period of time. There's going to be a college that is going to be established in England itself in a place called ha Haleybury, which is a college intended strictly for the servants of the company. When I say servants, I'm using the language of that time. Servants means employees of that company. 
right? So, so it, uh, someone who was going to come and work for the East India Company in the early 1800s would typically first go to Haleybury, which is where they would get a crash course on Indian history and civilization. Well, at least we should know who the Hindus are. I mean, you could be like Donald Trump and not know the distinction between Hindu and Hindi, because before the election he said, oh, you know, um, I, I, I really like the Hindis. You know, he's referring to the Hindu people. He, no, clueless. So you get, a, you get a crash course, right? You get a crash course at Haleybury. Then they're going to establish a college in India itself, in Calcutta, right? So forth and so on. But this is all happening in the early 1800s. The question for us is, what are the schools of thought that the British represent? And these are the four main schools of thought. I want to dwell on this a little bit and explain what the difference is. So there's the utilitarian school of thought. What is utilitarianism? Anyone? You must be familiar with it, yes? Right, I know. That's the magic formula, right? So, illustration? Could you give an illustration? Sure. Uh, take the Aral Sea in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was fed by a river that the Soviets diverted to have mass agriculture in the region, but yeah. it took away the lives of the fishermen uh, fishing the Aral Sea. Yeah, okay. But it was justified? Because Be it fed millions of more people than just the 15 fishermen on the Aral Sea. Okay. Good illustration. Uh, you know, in, in uh, philosophy classes, uh, one of the, they, they will always give you a more dramatic uh, illustration of utilitarianism. What might that be? For example, 10 people get shipwrecked on an island. All right? And, you know, you're shipwrecked on an island, there's nothing to do there. Uh, so, you know, one of them happens to be short like myself, and nine happen to be very tall, so they decide to pick on the short person. And this would be justified. Why? Because the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Right? The pleasure that these nine derive from doing something outweighs the pain of that one person. And that would be a classic example, you know, an exaggerated example in some fashion. Utilitarianism, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Let's translate it into a different kind of English. From the point of view of the exponents of utilitarianism, uh, and the exponents are three, that we have to think about, James Bentham, right? Uh, James Mill, right? Not James Bentham, Jeremy Bentham. James Mill, who worked in the East India Company, Office of the Examiner of Correspondence, which I had described to you in substantial detail in my previous lecture, right? And his son, John Stuart Mill, right? So these, these, these are three philosophers who are well known as exponents of utilitarianism. From their point of view, utilitarianism in India meant that the company or the rulers of India had to be fundamentally interested in only two or three things. Good laws. Good laws. Now, of course, we can all dispute what we mean by good laws. We can, right? I mean, some people might say that, well, some, a law is good if it's just. Uh, others might say, well, in fact, actually, what's really more important is that a law should always be clear. I want to, by the way, remind you that the notion of rule of law is actually quite complicated because a state can have a very clear set of laws. But let's, if you take an instance where the state does not take any effort to make known to the public what these laws are, then you might not have met the conditions for what is called the rule of law, right? So, the, so a law should be, should be stated in clear, unequivocal terms to the extent that is possible. It should be made known to the public and it should not discriminate. And you could say that that might be one definition of a good law. However one defines it, from the utilitarian standpoint, the company had an obligation to have clear laws in India. Now, we'll, we'll touch on this subject again in greater detail because we're going to have to distinguish between civil law and criminal law. All right? We're going to have to distinguish between the two. But this much should be understood that utilitarianism is arguing that the company is bound to introduce good, clear laws 
Its second obligation is to have simple tax structures. Simple tax structures. That we should have some plan for revenue because how is a company going to fund its activities in India? Right? We need some kind of revenue structure. Uh, and so one of the things that the company has to do over the years is they have to try to learn, well, how is it that Indian rulers okay, collected revenue? What was the system that they did? What are, uh, uh, are there rights in land, for example, in Indian society? So forth and so on. Right? That's the utilitarian point of view in a nutshell. Right? Now, let's, let's understand it another way. The utilitarians are singularly devoid of moralizing, if I may put it this way. Now, that doesn't mean at all that the utilitarian philosophers um, didn't think that, in fact, the British are superior. They very, very much thought that. But that's not part of their public language, for the most part. This is what I mean when I say that they're singularly devoid of moralizing. That moralizing is something that is going to be taken up by the evangelicals. So this is where we get to that. Yes, Lorenzo. Would you say, because you said that it's devoid of moralizing, yeah. would you say that this utilitarianism, would it be very simple to what, very similar to what the utilitarians would offer in England or in the Americas? It's sort of a you know, consistent ideology, wherever you are, you have to do Absolutely. Things, so it's, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, one reason you don't want to do the moralizing is because you are going to create certain feelings of resentment among the local population. Whenever you create feelings of resentment among the people you're governing, you endanger the foundation of your own rule. Right? So, the, 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 and this is what utilitarianism really means. That look, you know, we don't have to get into ethical issues. We don't have to moralize. We don't have to sing the praises of Christianity. Which, again, doesn't mean that people like Bentham and Mill did not represent a Christian civilization. In some sense, they did. Right? But that impulse is something that is going to be shelved, if I may put it this way, at least among the utilitarians. And recall that at least in the 1770s, all the way until the early 1800s, in fact, the company's charter actually forbid proselytization. Right? Now, in 1813, when the charter is going to be renewed in 1813, I've spoken about this on a number of occasions, in 1813, the prohibitions on proselytization are going to be removed. The Christian missionaries are going to have a relatively free hand, and this is going to continue to grow over the next several decades. Right? Particularly in the 1820s and 1830s, we're going to see a kind of a fervent missionary flavor uh, in many of the British writings that you are going to encounter about India. So the evangelical school of thought, and going back to Lorenzo's question, let me just say that it's also the case that the evangelicals are very busy back in England itself. Okay? Just as utilitarianism was obviously a school of thought that was resonating in Britain itself and elsewhere, the evangelicals are very busy in Britain itself. So for example, the evangelicals are thinking about, well, how do we take care of the poor? Why is it that there are people who are poor? And the evangelical point of view, you should understand, is very much the point of view that you still find, for example, in many circles in the United States. The poor are poor because they deserve to be poor. Or because these people are lazy. They don't work hard enough. They don't have the work ethic. You know, so forth and so on. Right? This, this is the evangelical view. Of course, you need to have some degree of Christian mercy towards the poor. But by and large, the evangelical view is... The poor deserve to be poor. You know, all right? Now the evangelicals are going to become increasingly prominent, particular in India, particularly when the ban on missionary activity is going to be lifted. So they are going to be doing the moralizing. They're going to be saying that, well, one of the reasons why India has fallen into our hands like a plum, cherry, you know, is because frankly, Indians do not adhere to the kinds of ethical standards that we adhere to. They don't have the grace of Christianity, so forth and so on. And it is our duty as a Christian power to introduce Christianity. It's a very interesting question, which I'm not going to address uh, in, in this course at any length, but I raise it for you right now for you to reflect on it. It is an, un, it is an indubitable fact, an unquestionable fact, that Christianity under British rule really never was able to get going if I may use a colloquialism, it never really, they were never really able to succeed in India.
And this is a, a, a very interesting question. Why is it that, for example, that Islam certainly succeeded? Because we know that Islam also comes to India from, from obviously from abroad, comes from Western Asia. Uh, uh, yes, Islam had a much longer history in India than Christianity did in some respects, although we know that I mentioned to you that there was Christianity present in South India uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, the year 70 uh, of the Common Era, almost 2,000 years ago. But Christianity never really made those kinds of inroads. And then we found that the Portuguese uh, obviously uh, are a Christian power as well. But under the British dispensation, Christianity did not really flourish. Okay? Now, the key thing here simply is that I am saying, what is the context in which we are discussing this? We are saying, what schools of thought do the people who are administering India represent? Right? So one school of thought is strictly of the view that what you should do is you should have this kind of utilitarian point of view. The second school of thought says, yeah, well, no, no, you don't. Of course, I have to say, as a, as, as a crucial note here, that all schools of thought, in some sense, do represent a kind of utilitarianism as well. Right? That yes, it is a function of the company, of the government, Right? to introduce simple laws, clear laws, to have a tax structure that is workable, etc., etc. But then you get the other gesture, such as this whole idea of proselytization, moralizing, uh, the notion of moral improvement. We have an obligation to improve these people. And, and that might entail, among many other things, passing legislation which would abolish certain kinds of atrocities and abominations. Right? Where we, will, we will look at that later on, but this is the general outlook represented by the evangelical school of thought. Then you have a third school of thought, which, is, which might be called the Burkean school of thought, named after Edmund Burke. Now, I have mentioned to you Edmund Burke uh, in a different context there, because he was a person who was going to lead the impeachment proceedings against Warren Hastings in the British Parliament uh, in 1789. All right. uh, Warren Hastings was the first Governor General of India. Recall that, right? This, this position is created by the Act of 1773, the position of the Governor General of India. Now, what is the Burke in School of Thought? Very briefly, Burke takes the view that India is something that has been entrusted to the British. Okay, there is a notion of what you might call trusteeship. So you know that in, uh, and we have to, dis we have to distinguish this between, between the Burkean school of thought and the, and, and the school of thought which is very similar, but there are some differences, namely the, the, namely the Guardian or Platonist school of thought. Okay. The trusteeship model is that we are, in a way, like trustees. Okay. We're like trustees because India, for some reasons, has fallen into a state of disarray. And in fact, according to Burke, the company has contributed very substantially to that state of disarray. It has created a kind of a social anomie, right? a severe dislocation in Indian society. Now. I recall the Bengal famine, which I had discussed. Right? The fact that the obviously that Indian institutions are crumbling in some fashion. Right? So Burke's argument is, number one, let's, let's parse it. Number one, that we shouldn't assume that we are morally superior to the Indians. Secondly, a country is best governed when one tries to adhere to the customs and traditions of the people who are being governed. Now you can see this is completely inimical to the evangelical school of thought because the evangelical school of thought is going to argue ah, there are certain kinds of Indian practices which are at abominations uh, you know, and we have a moral obligation to in fact actually you know, get rid of these, right? to improve the country. The Burkean school of thought is an organic model of how change takes place in a society. You work with the institutions you have. Right? Try, let's try to understand why these institutions have crumbled in India, what our own role is. Well, we understand that we have a certain kind of hegemony at the moment. Right? We have a hegemony at the moment. 
This is what it means to be acting as a trustee. We are simply going to be holding the ship, as it were, until such time as the Indians have recovered their own footing. Once they've recovered their own footing, our job is over. We leave. Right? That's the Burkean model. And Burke was, of course, in some ways inherently conservative. He was the same person who was opposed to the French Revolution. Right? Uh, he has this famous line where he denounces what he calls the cashiering of kings. To cashier a king means to behead a king. Right? Yes? Sir, what was your first point um, that you said, you said Burke shouldn't, said people shouldn't presume that they have a moral... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the, that the, it's not, we shouldn't assume that we are now ruling over these territories in India because we are morally superior. No, he doesn't say that. No. Right? And, and in fact, what I'm suggesting is that what is distinctive to the Burkean school of thought is this idea that you have to work with the local customs and traditions, all right, because you can only really achieve change in a society if that change is organically produced. If it comes as a set of fiats from the top, right, it will never produce that kind of organic change in a society. That's the Burkean school of thought. And then you get the guardians, right? And what's the difference? So you know where, you know where the word is from, right? It's from Plato's Republic, because for those of you who read Plato's Republic, you know that there is this whole idea that you have a hierarchical society, and on top of that society are what are called the guardians. How does one think of the guardians? As I said, there's some overlap with the Burkean model, but one way to think of the guardians is to use that Latin phrase, in loco parentis, right? What is, this? what is the function of a school, for example? It takes the place of parents, right? So the guardian model is that we are guardians. See, this assumes that Indians are like children. They're like children, right? They, have, they don't have that level of maturity at this point in time. But, of course, children eventually grow up. Now, uh, the time span for a nation is much longer than it is for a child on the whole, right? But this is what that model really presumes. Uh, it still shares a great deal with the Burkean model because it says that, yes, we should not do things that will disaffect the Indians. We should not do things which will be a provocation, right? So, for example, interfere, what would be the greatest kind of provocation? Interfering in the religious practices and customs of the natives. Because religion is dear to everyone, it's particularly dear to people in India. This is the primordial element of their identity, religion. Right? So this is what the guardian model is. And what we're going to find is that different people, different rulers will represent different elements of that. And that's, that, although as I've already indicated to you very clearly, I'm suggesting to you that the utilitarian model was in fact present to some degree in all of these people, right? Except that, that uh, someone, someone who might be, uh, you know, an exponent of the guardian school, if I may put it this way. It's, and when I say the guardian school, it's not this, this is, this is a theory put forward by Raghavan Iyer, uh, an Indian scholar when he wrote a piece called Utilitarianism and all that about 60 years ago where he basically distinguished between these four models and I think in fact it's actually quite useful. Uh, so when I say guardian it's not that they were self-appointed or, or self-described guardians, uh, some of these uh, rulers that I'm talking about, but nonetheless um, what we find uh, is that if you look at uh, the Indian ruling class, okay, and at this point in time there is no formal civil service, okay? This, the, there is going to be a formal civil service, it's called the ICS. Uh, they were very often referred to as, the ICS is the Indian Civil Service, uh, as the heaven appointed, uh, because if you, you were eventually appointed to the Indian Civil Service, you could be in your early, mid-twenties, with very little knowledge of India, and you might find yourself the ruler of a district with a population of over a million. Right? And you barely have any knowledge of India at that point in time. Yes, Lorenzo. Just a question yeah. on, on the four schools. Um, yeah. It seems to me that a distinction of the last two, the Burkins and the Guardians, yeah. is that they regarded British rule in India as temporary. You know, they were there Absolutely. To restore, as, as restorers of the With regards to the first two models, yes. do they see rule as temporary also, or it's just 
not an issue that they engage with. Like, how do they reconcile themselves no. with that? If if you 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 uh, if you if you wanted to, you could argue that the utilitarian utilitarians and evangelicals see that they're in India indefinitely, okay. right? They they're in India indefinitely. Um, I mean, uh, James Mill, for example, uh, History of British India, uh, the alumnus work. Uh, he never went to India, of course. I mean, he's, he's always based in London. Uh, writes a six-volume work uh, called The History of British India, uh, 1818. And he says very clearly in that work that Indians represent the rudest stage of civilization. The word rude at that time in English didn't only mean what it means today, when if I'm rude to a person. Right? Uh, uh, don't uh, have any manners, speak, you know, uh, crassly to the person, so forth and so on. Rude meant to be at a primitive stage of civilization. Right? So it's a rudest civilization. That was, that was James Mill's assessment in 1818 when he wrote the history of British India. So that these people are at, at a very elementary stage. Uh, and somebody like Mill uh, doesn't really envision that British rule is going to come to an end quickly. However, I have to modify that view uh, by saying that if you are strictly a utilitarian philosopher and proceeding along utilitarian lines, in the long run it doesn't matter who's ruling you. So long as you apply the laws, the laws are good, simple and just, clearly understandable, that you have a tax structure, you have a, a apparatus of governance which is efficient. To that extent, you could say that somebody like James Mill is frankly not a racist, to that extent. That is that if you were strictly applying the utilitarian model, it doesn't really matter. Right? Of course, we would have to ask to what extent a utilitarian philosopher was only a utilitarian philosopher because there was always a tinge of moral superiority, etc., etc. Right? So, you know, these are not like four clear baskets. I mean, there's obviously intersectionality here. And they're cutting across each other, but it's just that they represent four different strands of thought. Now, let's try to understand, having given you the larger framework, let's take one simple issue, such as law. Okay? And when we take law, let's make a distinction between civil law and criminal law. A very common distinction, as I think all of you will grant. So civil law will concern such things as the laws pertaining to marriage, divorce, adoption, inheritance, property. Right? And we know what criminal law, what the jurisdiction of criminal law will be. Now when the British are in India and, governor, and Warren Hastings becomes the governor general in 1773, okay, uh, recall, that, recall that one of the problems I've mentioned to you before, but keep it in mind, uh, the British are not really a knowledgeable about Indian languages. Uh, there are going to be a few exceptions. We're going to find that there are going to be people like Sir William Jones, uh, who is going to be appointed to the Supreme Court. So he comes from uh, uh, Britain. He's, he's an exceedingly important figure in, in many ways. Um, and he's one of the reasons he's a very important figure is that Jones is among the first people in the world to put forward the idea which is going to become the bedrock of linguistics. And that is an idea, namely that Sanskrit, right, the language of the Brahmins, the language in which uh, the principal texts uh, are going to be written, not just by the way philosophical and religious texts, but even, for example, treatises in grammar, uh, in mathematics, and science and obviously literary works, right? So the ancient language of India. So he's the first person to make the argument that Sanskrit grammar, Sanskrit, sorry, and Greek and Latin are all related languages. And these are what are going to be get, what are eventually going to be known as Indo-European languages, right? And then the argument is that in fact that all three of them in fact actually came from a common source. We don't know much about that. That's sometimes called proto Indo-European, right? So William Jones is the, the first person to actually uh, articulate that argument. Um, and Jones is, is someone who has come to India and he's a member of the Supreme Court of Bengal. Right? Now, uh, 
the question, so, so Jones is certainly uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, to some extent uh, in Indian languages, he knows Sanskrit, and a Persian which is not, quote, an Indian language, obviously, is nonetheless the language of the Mughal administration of India, and in fact it remains the official language of administration even under the company until 1835. Persian, not English, right? Think about that, all right? So, exceptions like Jones, with some knowledge of Indian languages, the vast majority of company officials do not know Indian languages. Number one. Number two, when Warren Hastings assumes a position of governor general, and in the years thereafter, he comes to the conclusion that, yes, of course, criminal law, the jurisdiction that the British will have, will apply to everyone. I, I, I mean, if A commits a murder against B, or a, a criminal offense against B, it doesn't matter whether A is a Hindu or a Muslim, and it doesn't matter whether B is a Hindu or a Muslim. Okay? And there will be one criminal law which will be common to everyone. However, that cannot be the case under for civil law. It cannot be the case. Hindu laws of inheritance, Hindu laws of marriage are going to be vastly different. And in fact, they'll be vastly different from one religious community to another. Now, let's just pause to think for a moment, right? So this is what he says. He says that in civil suits, and I quote, the laws of the Quran, the laws of the Quran, with respect to the Mohammedans, Mohammedans means Muslims, right? And those of the Shastras, that is the Hindus, Shastras are the Hindu law books, with respect to the Gentus, Gentus means Hindus, shall be adhered to. Right? So that, that Muslims, that if a Muslim woman, let's say a Muslim woman in India, 1780s, 1790s, 1800, a Muslim woman wants divorce from her husband. So what laws shall apply? The laws that shall apply shall be those which are stipulated in the Quran, and when, when, by the way, Warren Hastings says the Quran here, we know from other writings that he means not only the Quran, but he also means the Hadiths, that those are the Islamic traditions. Okay, right? And if a Hindu man wanted to divorce his wife, or a Hindu woman wanted to divorce her husband, the laws that would apply would be those which are particular to the Hindu community. However, Let's try to complicate what's going on here. We have two fundamental considerations. One, what do we mean when we say Hindu and when we say Muslim? Right? And you might say, well, isn't it self-evident? Right? That someone who swears by the Quran or who follows the Quran or who reads the Quran is a Muslim. In the, case of, in the case of Hindus, it may be a bit more complicated because the Hindus do not have a book which is comparable to the Quran. They don't, right? They, and they're not, as it's called, the people of the book, right? They don't have a book. So what is Warren Hastings' theory? What is he going to attempt to do? All right? What he's going to attempt to do, and this is where we get to the second point. I said there are two big considerations. First, we have to ask... Let me articulate it in a different language and this question will come up again in the second half of the course. What do we mean when we say Hindu and when we say Muslim? And what I'm suggesting to you is that he is in fact ascribing a corporate identity, that is an identity in the aggregate, to somebody called a Hindu. Because I can tell you, my forefathers in the 1600s, as it were, okay, whoever they might have been, right? In, and of course in the centuries preceding that, and perhaps all the way until about the 1770s, 1780s, would never have described themselves as Hindus. No Hindu ever described herself or himself in that language at this time that Warren Hastings is writing this. 
Why? Because you were, if you were a follower of Vishnu, the god Vishnu, then you were a Vaishnava. If you were a follower of the god Shiva, you were a Shaivite. If you were a follower of the goddess, who represents the cosmic primeval energy, right? For example, in Bengal, you have Durga and Kali. Right? Well, then you were what's called a Shakto. So forth and so on. You didn't describe yourself as, as a Hindu. This is an identity that is now going to be imposed upon you. And of course, it's going to get formalized in such things as, for example, the census. Much later on. Right? So when the census comes into operation, which is going to be in the late in the 19th century, they're going to say, okay, what's, you know, it's like the US, United States census, or if you fill out a form, sometimes they might say, what religion are you? Or what ethnic group are you? Check one. Right? Are you a Hindu or are you a Muslim? But you see what it's doing. It's ascribing a corporate identity to people who, in fact, do not have that identity as such. So we're going to have to ask ourselves whether this is the beginning in a very rudimentary sense of that divide between a group of people who are now given, let me use a different word instead of the word corporate, who are now given a monolithic identity, who have now been all right, absorbed into a single monolithic identity called Hindu and another identity called Muslim. So that's one set of problems. Second set of problems is how do we know what Hindu law is? Okay, how do we know what Hindu law is? So because if we're going to decide what the rights of inheritance are for a Hindu woman, so does a Hindu married Hindu woman have rights of inheritance? Now you could, by the way, in Britain, did a married woman have rights of inheritance in the 1780s? The answer is a resounding no, she didn't. Okay, she didn't have rights of inheritance. Now you could simply assume that because a woman in England, which represents a superior civilization from your point of view, doesn't have rights of inheritance, you, should, you could automatically assume that, well, certainly, an, certainly a Hindu woman is not going to have rights of inheritance. But that may not be true. Yes? Um, do the Vishnu and Shiva followers, do they not like being clumped together? Do they not identify oh, them? At that point, they wouldn't have, no. No, because, because you could have a kind of a sectarian differences between them, which might be quite immense, you know? Right? And, and then, of course, we, you know, we, I can't. I think you'll appreciate what I'm saying here. I can't get into the whole history of Hinduism here and what are the real differences between the Vaishnavas and the Shaktos and the Shaivites and the Tantrics, so forth and so on. But the, the key thing here is that yes, you could say you know. So there's a class of texts, for example, known as the Puranas. Okay, Puranas. The word Purana literally, by the way, means old. Uh, although you can write a book now and call it a Purana. This is one strategy that a person might use. Uh, so these Puranas are what you might call mythological texts. Okay? And they're written over a period of centuries. All the Puranas are either Shaivite or Vaishnavite or Shakto. That is where the goddess is the key figure, not, not one of the male gods. All right? Now, when I say sectarian, Again, we have to be very careful because the word sectarian arises in the context of Judeo-Christian and Islamic histories. So when we say that there were sectarian differences in Christianity, what do we mean? Differences, for example, between the Protestants and the Catholics. And then uh, among the Protestants, there could be enormous difference between the Anabaptists, you know, okay, uh, and the Methodists, so forth and so on, right? So those would be sectarian histories of Christianity, right? That would be the model. What you find in the Puranas is that a Purana is predominantly either Shaivite or Vaishnava or Shakto. But that doesn't mean that in a Shaivite Purana that there is no place for Vishnu. It's just that Vishnu is going to become the inferior god. In the Vaishnava Purana, Vishnu becomes the superior god and Shiva becomes the inferior god, right? So, so, so this is what I meant. We can, we can get into a long history of what it really means to speak about this kind of, quote, sectarianism. But I'm using that category with a certain amount of proviso.
what I'm trying to describe here is a scenario where we're saying that first question here is, okay, what do we mean when we say Hindu and Muslim? Okay, how was this monolithic identity now superimposed upon people? All right. Number two is how do we know what Hindu law is? Because now there are going to be a number of problems that the British have to think about. One way in which you try to determine what Hindu law is, you talk to the Brahmins. However, the British have this view that the Brahmins are a cunning, deceptive lot. So your main source is the Brahmins because of course the, because the notion that the British have, which is not entirely incorrect, is that the Brahmins are the repositories of knowledge in India. They are the ones to whom all of the knowledge of the sacred traditions and the sacred laws and the law books has been entrusted. And we know that for a very long period of time, okay, all of this came down in the oral tradition. All of this came down in the oral tradition before it was committed to writing. Now we get to another problem. So there are a number of associated problems. Keep all of them in mind when you think about what's happening here. All right. So we want to determine what is Hindu law. Let's supposing you have 15 different books. All right. Now, the first thing is, which of these is authoritative? You see, you have to you have to remember the context from where the British are coming. Yes. But why sort of why did the British want to recognize these differences? Why didn't they just have one British common civil and criminal law and just you know settle it that way? No, you see, you can have a common because you can have a common and criminal law, which they will. You cannot have it for civil matters. They can't. They no, you cannot have it for the simple reason that their view is that let's suppose you applied the laws of divorce commonly among Hindu, Muslim, and Hindu communities. Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh communities. They're going to, it's going to create an uproar. Okay. <laughs> it's going to create an uproar because, because what is permissible in Islam to a woman may be very different than what is permissible to a Christian or a Hindu. As simple as that. You know, right? I mean, the whole, and you, you could, the, the question, by the way, is with us in 2017, the whole debates that take place over, quote, the hijab. See, you, 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 you know, and of course we know that there are different kinds of veiling, so forth and so on. But, the, but if you look, the context here is that there is a set of Muslim practices, now, do, do we apply a common civil law, which you could say that it's banned, right? But then the question, of course, is that does that actually create a certain kind of religious dissent among certain people, right? So you have to now first establish and determine what is this thing called Hindu law. So you say, all right, we've got a problem here because let's say we have 15 different texts. Now, the first question is to determine which text is authoritative. How do you determine that? What you, the way you determine it is you, try, you go to the people, the local people. However, the local people are represented by Brahmins. The Brahmins, however, are a cunning, deceptive lot. Why? Because they maintain their hierarchy in Indian civilization by their obscurantism. That is that they actually obscure the truth rather than making it known to the people. Because this is the way in which they maintain their hierarchy. All right? So... The problem for the British is going to be how do we exactly establish it? But there is an epistemological problem. The epistemological problem is why elevate the text over the practice? See, what they want to do is they want to create a textual basis for law. A textual basis. And when you create a textual basis, then what you have to do is you have to create a authoritative text which is going to be acceptable to everybody in that community. All right. Let me let me now translate this into a different thing. We're moving into some questions that we're going to take up in great detail in the following segments for the next three weeks. But this is a good way of anticipating some of those questions are. All right. Let me give you an illustration that some of you might be somewhat familiar with. Uh, and I'm going to stretch that argument deliberately. Take somebody like Shakespeare. 
Okay? How do we determine what is the authoritative text? Now, you know, if you're a Shakespeare scholar, you know what you do is you go to what is called the first folio. Because you could say to yourself, oh, it's very simple, isn't it? You go to the first printed edition. No. Why? Because then you have to know the whole history of printing. Who was doing the printing? There were lots of printer's errors. And in fact, the first folio, of which there are over 200 copies, uh, the Folger Shakespeare Library has about 70 of them, okay? Even the first folio, there is actually differences. There are differences in the first folio, not to mention subsequent editions. Right? Now, by the way, this is comparatively simple because you're still talking about, okay, there and and there are people who spend their whole life just doing that, studying the first folio. That's all they do. You know? Trying to determine if there is if there is a line in a certain play and you find a divergence, which of these is the authentic version? Of course, you have to ask yourself, that's the epistemological question. Why does it matter? And you might say, well, of course it matters. I'm not, I'm not sure by the way it matters. Why does it matter? Because, because you say to yourself, ah, we have to know what the author intended. Well, then I have to ask you, why does that matter? If a, public, if a work is in the public domain for 500 years, Shakespeare is not just what he wrote. Shakespeare becomes all of us, so to speak. All of us who have read Shakespeare become part of the interpretive community around Shakespeare and help establish the text, so to speak. Now, in the case of India, it's far more complicated. Because the British view was that, so you have a text, I'm talking about 15 texts, but for each text you might have 10 different variants. Then you would say, which of these variants is the most authoritative? Because the British view is, this is how German biblical criticism took place. You find what is called the Ur text, which means the authentic core of the text. That's what you find, okay? The that's the, the authentic text. Then everything that has grown around it is like the jungle. Indian knowledge is like India itself. It's a jungle. And what do you do if you want to, if you want to penetrate the jungle? You take implements with you and you cut away. Cut away. This is what they're going to do. You, do you, you see what I'm arguing? This, because they are trying to establish, and they're going to do this for every text. They're going to try to attempt to do it for every text. Let's determine the original text. Why, why is it the case that this is important is a question that I'm asking. And what are the assumptions that they're making? The assumption they're making is that the Brahmins who are responsible for these texts have deliberately put in interpolations. They have added material to confuse the common people. Right? Because they are the sole repositories of this knowledge. Right? So, so this is that one of the great Orientalist tropes is this cunning, conniving Brahmin, the wily Brahmin. Right? Now, that's a very long story. This is, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I've, I've spoken about this at enormous length in several other you know, seminars where we look simply at the politics of knowledge systems. But I'm giving you the, the, the I'll have to take questions, in, uh, giving you sort of the gist of it. And the gist of it is precisely this, that what they're going to attempt to do is they're going to attempt to create a Hindu law for the Hindus. It related to civil matters, okay? Rights of property, inheritance, divorce, marriage, all of that, okay? And then they're going to attempt to create something similar for Muslims, all right? Now, this is one set of, one set of interventions by the British, okay? Very quickly, let me move to another critical set of considerations, late 1700s, because what we're now looking at here is the transformation of Indian society. That's what we're looking at. Remember, the two main impulses behind utilitarianism. Good laws, and secondly, a system, a simple, clear system of taxation. Now, 
let's get to that second one, taxation. Right? I want to try to make something that is extremely dry. We're not in an accounting class here, right? So we want to try to understand the politics, the politics of this. When you are thinking of taxation, what is the main source? The two main sources are obviously trade. And what's the second main source? Property. Property. And that remains true for most countries. I mean, you know, if you're a taxpayer here, your property taxes are the major portion of what you pay. Okay? Property taxes. So, what are we looking at over here? The first question is, is there a conception of private property in India? There are, there are European sources which, going back to, there's a, for example, a Frenchman, Francois Bernier, you know, who was traveling in the Mughal, during the Mughal period in the Mughal Empire, and people like Bernier are firmly of the view that a conception of private property doesn't exist. That's his view. It's a, it's a view that is going to be embraced by a number of other Englishmen as well. Okay, a number of other Europeans and then Englishmen when India falls under British rule. Right? Because, because think of it this way, that when the company acquires the Divani, that is the, they become the revenue collectors. That's what that, it meant, right? They become the revenue collectors. So you could say that, well, it's very simple. All they're going to do is they're simply going to do what the company had done. They're going to simply take over the role of the company. But we have already seen, by the way, that, that there is a huge amount of social and economic dislocation going on in, in Bengal at this point in time, in the 1770s. Not only do you have the Bengal famine, but what you have obviously is that the company is now going to actually try to force a lot of cultivators to replace their food crops with cash crops, you know, growth of opium, for example, indigo. Right? There, all these changes taking place, and one of the things that the British want to do is they want to introduce systems of revenue collection, which from their point of view are going to be much more efficient. But in order to do that, they first have to establish what are rights in land like. Do people have rights in land? Is there a conception of private property? Because remember again, that the British point of view is that this is what actually distinguishes the Anglo-Saxon model from every other model. That is this notion of private property. Private property. Now, second consideration. When you're looking at this kind of thing, one is do you have a conception of private property or not? The British are leaning towards a view that no, there is no such conception. Okay. Why and what's the second consideration? One of the reasons why there's no such notion of private property is because India is politically what's the system from the British rhetorical point of view? Despotism. In despotism, there can be no conception of private property. Right? Because a despot is precisely a person who acts arbitrarily. That's the meaning of despotism arbitrariness. Now, think of the implications. One of the implications is that the Indian cultivator or landlord, assume for a moment that there is a landlord, one of the reasons why the Indian landlord has no incentive to improve his property is because he might invest a thousand rupees in improving his property, removing the weeds, bringing in superior forms of cultivation, and the next day the despot appropriates his land. That's what arbitrariness means. You have no in so th so th so the view is that in fact the land is not as productive as it could be. Okay. So we have to make it more productive. In order to make it more productive, we need to have a system of revenue collection that is appropriate for India, for the Bengal presidency, for that whole region of Bengal, 
Okay, and of course, at this point in time, so for example, you know, th th this is Madras over here. Remember that the British have a out big outpost over here. They have a big outpost over here, and and Bombay over here. Uh, what they're going to find out when eventually their rule is going to expand, uh, is they're going to find out that the systems of revenue and the notions of property rights are vastly different here than they were over here, in, in the Bengal Presidency, right? So, but at this point in time in the 1770s, moving into the 1780s and then into something called the permanent settlement, which is what I'm getting to right now, um, at this point they're still dealing largely with Bengal. So what do the British decide to do? The governor general of India at that point in time is a man called Cornwallis. Does that name ring a bell to anyone here? It should. Huh? Yeah, who was he? You remember? Battle of Yorktown. So this guy loses the British Empire, if I may put it this way, in America, as a reward, ship him off to India. Bad posting, you know, the tropics, diseases, right? And then he's gonna create mayhem over there, right? That, that, okay, this is a different kind of revolving door, you know, uh, as they say, okay? So, uh, you know, you, you move from one position of authority which you don't deserve to another, you know, from business to corporation to White House, you know, that kind of thing, right? There's a revolving door in American politics. So this is a revolving door here, you know, ship off this guy there, okay? Uh, and by the way, as a little footnote, since some of you might think, oh, this is another one of these incidental things that he's just, you know, there are big ties between, for example, Africa and India. Most of the people who are going to become, when Africa becomes, large chunks of Africa become parts of the British Empire, where do you think these people have served before in India? You know? So you, you, you send them to a worse posting. You know, from America to India is bad, then from India to Africa, that's the dark continent, medieval, really, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's how, they, that's how a lot of the thinking goes, in a way, tacitly, you know. All right, now, uh, so there are these, you know, intersections which we cannot look at over here in any detail between Africa and India in the beginning in the late 19th century. What is important here is Cornwallis introduces what is called the permanent settlement. Now the permanent settlement is based on two conceptions. Okay, I'm gonna, now I'm using a different language. One is uh, a language uh, of what is called the physiocrats. The physiocrats is a school of thought, it's French, basically the, the physiocrats essentially really believe that wealth is, re, the repository of wealth is land. Land. Land is the source of wealth. I'm putting it in a nutshell, in five words. Land is the source of wealth, the primary source of wealth. Okay? So therefore, if, if the physiocratic notion of land being the source of wealth is going to be important in the permanent settlement, it obviously means that the British are going to now think about what they're going to do with land right, and land rights in India. Then there is the Whiggish conception, okay, uh, the, the Whigs are a parliamentary party really, uh, the, but when we say Whiggish conception, this is the Whiggish conception is the notion of the primacy of the individual, the individual, okay. And I have to say, this is again a, a, a point uh, uh, which has huge implications. The British view is that in India, I'm gonna put this in this form, I want you to think about what it means. The British view is that in India, there are no individuals. There are only communities. There are communities. These communities can be demarcated by religion, they can be demarcated by caste, Brahmins, and then within that, different kinds of Brahmins, okay? The individual as an atom of being is a distinctly Western idea. That is the British conception. And this is going to hold true until the end of British rule. There are only communities a person, and, and we can't get into the whole philosophy of what is a person and what is the nature of personal identity. 
but in India, a person is always a member of a collectivity. He or she is a Hindu. When you say you are a Hindu or a Muslim, you mean immediately a community, a collectivity. He or she is a Brahmin or a Vaishya. He or she is a speaker of Gujarati or Bengali or Tamil or whatever. These are all collectivities. The individual doesn't exist. The notion of individual rights cannot exist under this conception. Okay? They are only communities and collectivities in India. So, now, if you're going to, however, improve the land, right? you have to create a class of people who are going to look like English landlords. And of course, remember the Burkean model. I know this is complicated, but you try to understand what's happening here, right? The Burkean model is that India itself has its own aristocracy, right? And one of the ways in which you implement reform in India is you work with the Indian aristocracy. Who are these native princes after all? The Nawabs and rulers and all of these. These are members of the Indian aristocracy, okay? What you're going to do then therefore under the permanent settlement is you try to craft a society which is going to create a class of people, right, who are modeled after the English landlord, okay, they're going to be modeled after the English landlord, and they, and you're going to come to an agreement with them. An agreement which will give them security and which will give you, the company, security as well. That agreement is called the permanent settlement. What did it mean in practical terms? What it meant was, the following. When the permanent settlement came into effect in 1793, what it meant very simply was the British under the permanent settlement came to agreement with these, with these English landlord types in India called zamindars. So the zamindar is a landlord. And the agreement was that the revenue so we have come to an agreement with you in 1793. This is the revenue that is going to be collected from you is going to be fixed in perpetuity. So let's supposing, the, let's supposing you come to an agreement with Zamindar A. And that agreement is the Zamindar is going to commit himself to giving 2,000 rupees which is a revenue he's collecting from his land to the company every year. If the following year, the harvest is very good, it will still remain 2000. Right? This is an incentive for you to improve your land. However, what if there is a drought the next year and the following year and the following year, you still have to give the same revenue you still have to give the same revenue. And in fact, by the way, in Bengal, this didn't change for over 100 years. It really was in perpetuity. However, it created enormous complications for the first couple of decades. Because if a landlord could not meet the revenue demand, what happened? The land was alienated. Alienated means the company said, we're selling it off. Now in the former system, the zamindar never had rights to the land. He had rights to the collection of the revenue on behalf of the Nawab, okay? Because there was a kind of a communal ownership, if I may put it this way. So the cultivator, the zamindar or landlord, and the state all had rights to the land. And very often, by the way, these rights were not stipulated in writing. Now I'm bringing in another point. I want, I'm going to have to pick this up, pick up on this later on. And that is what happens to a society when you transition from what you might call a culture of status to a culture of contract. Let me explain. <clears throat> 
because this is one of the significant and it's in my view it is not argued properly in most of the books that have been written on the permanent settlement okay there's this there's this economic aspect which i've discussed so the land is going to be alienated but on the other hand if if let's say since you fix the revenue in perpetuity there is incentive for the landlord to continue to improve the land right because you know you could get a bountiful harvest next five ten years but you're still paying the same amount of revenue so there's greater amount for you to keep obviously that's simple enough on the other hand we have said it could actually be sold it has been estimated that within 10 years of the permanent settlement one third of all the zamindars lost their land it became alienated however the aspect of it which has not been discussed which is my own reading of one of the implications of this and i want to explain that that will be my concluding comments for today i want you to think about it is that the coming of british rule fundamentally transformed indian society in many ways one of the ways i want you to think about is that india went from being a society where things were based on status to a society where things became based on contract. What I mean by this is the following. That in a society based on status, there is an unwritten code of rules among a group of people. And in this unwritten code of rules, it is also understood that there are certain forms of hierarchy. Right? We're, I'm not speaking about a society here which has no class distinctions or no forms of stratification. It does. But these are unwritten. So in a village, a Brahmin has certain kind of authority because that person belongs to an upper caste. Okay? That person has a certain kind of status. However, when you move to a society based on contract, the written word takes precedence over, okay? The written word takes precedence over a tacit understanding that existed between people. So let's suppose you take a loan, you know, in the year 1700. Now, very often this loan is not being recorded. It's understood. Okay, and if, you, if you're not able to collect the loan, well, there may or may not be certain repercussions. When you are living in a society under contract, there are no options. In other words, I take a loan from a car company and I'm unable to pay the loan, my monthly installments, what happens? They take, the bank possesses my car. That's a society based on contract. So you see the unwritten codes that were widely prevalent are now slowly going to get transformed into written codes, which you could say that, well, that's the imposition of the rule of law. Of course, we could question that because we know that even written laws do not apply equally to everybody. In principle, you could argue that black and white people are treated the same under the written set of laws that we have in this country. The evidence would suggest something entirely to the contrary, entirely to the contrary. Right? So there's no guarantee that that's simply because you have a written set of laws. All right? But when I say contract, I'm not only talking about laws. I'm talking about the fact that certain conceptions of what you might call the moral economy Okay, a moral economy are now going to get eviscerated. One of the things that happened in the Bengal famine, let's go back to that for a second, so you understand the argument I'm trying to make, is the collapse of the moral economy. And this is, an, this is a, a f expression used by an English historian in one of the most majestic works that has been written in 20th century history, E.P. Thompson, The Making of the English Working Class a huge work which is a study of the working class in England. And when he says, when he uses the phrase a moral economy, what he's simply saying is that, look, there were times even before the advent of modernity when there were shortages of food, for example. But he says that under the moral economy, there are limits to 
that you impose upon yourself to the degree of greed because of course let's supposing that you know there's a famine you start holding long before that and then when the fam you know start holding grain and then when the famine takes place what happens you know you, something that would cost a dollar you now start charging a hundred dollars that's unlimited greed and in the moral economy there are certain kinds of checks and constraints that are imposed in a community what happens under the advent of contract capitalism which is a phrase that i use is the collapse of this kind of moral economy right so this is really the shift that is now beginning to take place and i'm going to pick up on this narrative in my next lecture.